Okay, this is section 1.3 from the book. It's about quadratic equations. In this section, we are going to talk about all the different ways you can solve a quadratic equation and then get in a couple of application problems, so word problems involving uh, solutions that involve quadratics. First of all, what is a quadratic? Quadratic is a second degree polynomial, meaning the power of the highest term, like the, the, the variable power is, is two, is the highest. Uh, and we get the word quadratics from, well, it's the Greek for square, and square is second degree, so that's where we get that from. Standard form of a quadratic is ax squared plus bx plus c. This is probably something you've seen before. Okay, so one of the ways we, the first way we solve a quadratic equation, our first resort should be uh, factoring. And uh, factoring is not the easiest way necessarily, but it's usually the simplest and most uh, most efficient. Uh, if we can factor, we should because we get the nicest looking answers and we don't have to go through a large calculation process. So factoring is trying to figure out what two things multiply together to be another thing. And a very basic like example of factoring would be like if I had the number 74, like what numbers multiply together to be 74? Well, you can say it's like 2 and, uh, sorry, 2, what is, what is 74 divided by 2? 37, right? And then does 37 factor at all? No, it doesn't. So 2 and 37, those are the factors of 74. But it's a little more complicated with a quadratic. We have to look at the factors of this, this the, the multiplication factors of this 16 is cut this number at the end and take into consideration the leading coefficients of the other two terms uh, so The way you can do this is to really write out what are the coefficient? What are the factors of these coefficients? So 1 times 1 is the only way we can get 1 or negative 1 times negative 1 and then for 16 We can get 1 it's 1 times 16 or it's 4 times or it's 2 times 8 right or it's 4 times 4 and then we can look at combinations of products so what we need to do is find some some combination where we have a uh, where we have one of these terms times one of these terms plus or minus one one of these terms times one of these terms and we see if we get this middle term so let's like look at that if i tried the one and the one that would be one the one and the 16 that'd be 16. i can't add or subtract one and 16 to get negative six so it's not that right it's not going to be one and 16. if i look at the one and the two that's two if i look at the one and the eight that's eight 2 and 8 can go together to be negative 6 if the 2 is positive and the 8 is negative. So we, once we find that that's the case, we can just write out the next step, which is to write our first term, bring down the first sign. We had a, we had a minus 8x and a positive 2x, and then bring down the last sign and the last number. So negative 16 equals 0. Now we look at these two terms together and these two terms together and we say all right is there a factor here are there, are there common factors of course there are so we could take an x out of these first two terms uh, squared minus eight oh i keep putting these little dots on my page sorry uh, and then in the next two is two comes out so plus two and then x minus eight uh, and then we can look at these two things individually and say all right x minus eight is in common not individually together take the x minus eight out what's left over is x plus two We've now factored this quadratic. We use the zero product property, which is that a times b equals zero. That means a equals b. Or, sorry, a equals zero or b equals zero. That's the only way two numbers can multiply together to be zero if one of them is zero. So x minus eight could equal zero, or x plus two could equal zero. And then of course we just solve uh, for x in each of these. So x could be eight or negative two, um, and that's how we do it. We could represent it like this as a solution set, uh, just refer to the instructions for the problem you're given. Now, this is just one way of factoring. Of course, there's many ways. If you have a preferred way, please do it that way. All right, so here's a little, maybe some more difficult factoring problems. We'll, again, we're gonna look at the multiples of the leading coefficients, so one and one, 28, one uh, times 28, two times 14, uh, or it could be what, four times seven. Right, and so it looks to me the difference between 4 and 7 is 3 right away, so I know it's going to be this one. So I'll go x squared minus 7x plus 4x minus 28. Uh, and I'll do the same thing I did before. So x comes out of these first two terms with x minus 7 remaining. 4 comes out of the last two terms with x minus 7. This is all equal to 0. So then x minus 7 times x plus 4 
is equal to 0. 0 product property will tell me that x is equal to 7 and negative 4. Okay, for that one. This one is a little more trick, a little more difficult because my leading coefficient is no longer 1. So I have the possibility of 1 times 1 and the possibility of 1 times 2, or negative 1, negative 2. Okay. Uh, 6 is 1 times 6 or 2 times 3. Those are the two ways to get 6. So we look at this and we're like, okay, if I take 2 times 3, that's 6. 1 times 2, that's 4. 13 and uh, 6 and 4 don't get, go together to be 13. Okay, so that's not going to work. If I take the 2 and the 6, that's 12. And the 1 and the 1, that's 1. 1 and 13 go together to be, uh, sorry, 1 and 12 go together to be 13 if they're both negative. So we take 2x squared minus uh, 1x minus 12x plus 6. What's in common between the first two? It's an x with a, sorry, with a, yeah, with a 2x minus 1 left over. If we take out the negative 6 from these last two terms, we get 2x minus 1 left over. Uh, this is all equal to 0. So 2x minus 1 times x minus 6 equals 0. 0 product property will tell us that x could be positive 1 half or uh, positive 6. Okay. So that's factoring. Uh, we can also solve another way to solve quadratics is by the uh, square root property. So uh, generally, if we have this 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 kind of format right here, I mean, if it's not given to you, it can be achieved by a process called completing the square, which is next. Okay. So we can uh, here if we it's okay to take the square root of both sides. Square root is essentially a, a rational exponent to the one half. So if you raise like x squared to the one half power, this is just x. That's actually the absolute value of x, but we'll get into that later. Um, and so you, you go about doing this, and this is like an illustration of the process right here. This is where our absolute value comes into place. So there's a step missing here where 4 and minus 1 is equal to uh, the absolute value of 4. Because, well, there's reasons for this, like same reason that uh, x, if x, what is the square root of x squared? It's the absolute value of x, right? Although I guess actually it's not really the absolute value of 4. It's the absolute value of 4n minus 1 is equal to 4. And then you use how to solve absolute value to get that. But um, if that's confusing to you, to be honest, it's not going to it's not gonna cause any issues really when you're solving these as long as you remember to do this plus or minus. So then you just solve for n and you get this. Let's do an example of these. So here's one here. Now you can't square root both sides right away here. You need to get the squared thing, the squared term by itself first. So we need to subtract 2 from both sides. So we'll have 3n minus 1 quantity squared is equal to 16. Now if we square root both sides, we'll have the absolute value of 3n minus 1 is equal to 4. So 3n minus 1 is equal to plus or minus 4. So 3n minus 1 could equal 4 or 3n minus 1 could equal negative 4. Add the 1 to both sides, 3n is equal to 5, 3n is equal to negative 3. So n could be 5 thirds, or n could be uh, negative 1. So those are the two possible answers for this problem. You could write that as a solution set if you want, or you could say it's, you know, n is equal to negative 1 and 5 thirds. All these are all acceptable ways to represent your answer. Oh, I didn't know there was another one on here. Sorry, let's, let's go back. Let me... Uh, let me write that over here. X minus 2 quantity squared equals negative 4. Okay, this is the squared term is by itself already. So we can say then if we square root both sides that we have got um, the absolute value of X minus 2 is equal to what's the square root of negative 4? Can we do that? I mean, yeah, we can. Remember, the square root of negative 4 is the same thing as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 4. And we know that this is I and there's a we've we've talked about how this works right we know what a we know what a an, an imaginary number is um you should go watch the video we have on that so this is the same thing as so square root of 2 is just two, square root of 4 is just 2 so this is just 2i right so this equals 2i so what we have is x minus 2 is equal to plus or minus 2i and we get x is equal to 2 plus or minus 2i there's two different answers here right it's x is equal to 2 plus 2i or x is equal to 2 minus 2i. Okay, now uh, 
I guess we actually had four ways to solve a quadratic because that the square root method there, the square root property is kind of an in-between method. But completing the square is one of your main ones here. And this is going to be super versatile for a lot of reasons. A lot of times this is actually a lot faster than even plugging into the quadratic formula. Um, so how do we complete the square? Well, the idea here is to create a perfect square trinomial where one doesn't already exist. So what the, what the, heck, what the heck does that mean? Well, we can do something by... Uh, there's a couple ways to do this, but what I like to do is to add the constant to both sides of the equation to get just the p stuff on one. So we have p squared plus 14p equals 38. Now we need to put something right here that's going to make the left side of this equation a perfect square trinomial. What is a perfect square trinomial? It's something in the form of a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Okay, so essentially uh, we need to have this coefficient be double whatever this coefficient is times this coefficient uh, and then we need this to be a perfect square and this to be a perfect square so not only do these need to be perfect squares these coefficients of one in this case would be perfect square um, but yeah okay so so let's look at this one is a perfect square 14 needs to be 2 times a times b so 2 times 1 is 2 so what was this? It needed to be 7, and we had to have b squared over here. So this needed to be a plus 49. You can another way to do this if you have simple a simple completing the square problem like this. If this is your middle coefficient, just divide it by 2 and square it. Okay, so 14 divided by 2 is 7. Square it. We need to add 49. But and it's the addition property of equality says if we do that to the left, we have to do it to the right. So we get p squared uh, plus I think I have another problem on here, so I'm actually going to move it over here. Uh, p squared, uh, do this in this color, p squared plus 14p plus 49 is equal to 38 plus 49, which is something, some number, 77, 87, was it 87? I can't do math today, sorry. Okay, so we got 87. Now, what was the whole point of this? Well, it was to... Uh, it was to make this a perfect square trinomial. So we can write that as p plus 7 quantity squared equals 87. And now you see where we're back at our square root property. So if we square root both sides of this, okay, we'll get uh, p plus 7, absolute value p sub plus 7 is equal to the square root of 87 plus or minus. So we'll get that p is equal to 7 plus or minus the square root of 87. Okay. All right, uh, one of them kind of had another problem on the previous page, but it got skipped over, so we'll, it's okay. We'll, we'll do this one. So uh, n plus 6, n minus 1. This is not a perfect square trinomial. We need to make it one, so let's add 1 to both sides. Okay, so we'll have n squared plus 6n plus something is equal to 1. What is going to go here? We'll look at this coefficient. It's 6 divided by 2. That's 3 squared is 9. So this would make a perfect square trinomial on the right on the left side. We have to add to the other side too. So we'll have n plus 3 quantity squared is equal to 10. Okay, if you square root both sides, you'll have that n plus 3 is equal to plus or minus 10. Remember, I just kind of, sorry, plus or minus the square root of 10. We just skipped a little step with the absolute value. Okay, so now this is going to be n is equal to negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 10. Those are the two answers to that one. Okay, this one here is a little tricky now, okay, because this is no longer a leading coefficient of 1. So this is this is, gets more complicated. But we can kind of for, sort of ignore that there's a 3 there, but we have to get rid of it first. So how do we do that? Well, add 2 to both sides first. Get rid of that. Um, get rid of that, that constant. So we'll have 3p squared plus 12p is equal to 2. Okay, now what we're going to do is factor out this leading coefficient. So this is nice that in that 3 goes into 12 nicely, but it doesn't all have to. Like we can have this weird fraction in our middle term. That's fine. We still do the same process. So if we take this 3 out, we'll have p squared plus 4p, and then it equals 2 is over here. Now what we need to do is figure out what would go here. Well, if we take this middle thing, right, and we need a leading coefficient inside the parentheses. Sorry, we need a perfect square trinomial inside the parentheses. So 4 divided by 2 is 2, squared is 4, so we need to add 4 here. 
Now, what did we just do to the left side? We added 4 in the parentheses, but we're, everything in that parentheses is being multiplied by 3. So really, we added a value of positive 12 to the left side. So we need to do the same thing to the right side. Okay, so what does that leave us with? It leaves us with 3 times p plus 2 quantity squared is equal to 14. And now we can divide both sides by 3, right? because we want this squared thing by itself. We'll have p plus 2 quantity squared is equal to 14 thirds. Square root of both sides, p plus 2 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 14 thirds. So then p is equal to negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 14 thirds. And you can, you can rationalize the square root of 14 thirds by making it, what would that be? Uh, square root of 30, square root of 42 over something, over 3. Um, but you don't need to do that extra step there. That, that's, that's done at this point. Okay, so if we look at closely at this process of completing the square with a square with a standard form of a polynomial, we have ax squared plus bx plus c. Let's just run through the steps here, okay? We've, we would factor out the a from the left side. Then we take our middle co we take this middle term, right, divide it by 2, and then square it. So this is that middle term divided by 2, and this is it squared. And since we did that, we multiply everything in there by a, and we add that whole thing to the right side as well. Okay. Then we can factor, we can divide everything on everything by a, right? So we divide both sides by a to get to over here, right? Then we just are going to factor out. We're going to get a common denominator, not factor. We're going to get a common denominator on the right side by uh, I'm going to add those two fractions. Okay. Now we have the right side looking like this and the left side looking like that. And then if we square root both sides, this is, should look kind of familiar to you already. And then if we're trying to solve for x here, and we end up with, this is the quadratic formula, okay? So the quadratic formula is derived completely by just, take, just, just solving um, for x with a standard form of a polynomial with just unknown variable or the unknown coefficients. So how do we use a quadratic formula? Well, it's real straightforward. We just need to uh, we just need to determine what those coefficients are. The coefficient of the leading term, coefficient of the middle term, and then the constant at the end. So for this one, um, it gets a little bit confusing. So just to show you, this is not looking like a quadratic already. Uh, it's not in the standard form. So we need to get it into the standard form first. So this would be 2b squared plus 3b equals 1. We need to get that 1 to the left side. So 2b squared plus 3b minus 1 equals 0. Now, this is confusing because b is my variable here, but I, I only have the quadratic formula was to equal x. Don't get confused here. You're trying to solve now for b in the problem. So if you want to, you can say it's 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. Now, what is your a, b, and c? a is equal to 2, b is equal to 3, c is equal to negative 1. If you plug this into the quadratic formula, you'll have negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 9 minus 4 times 2 times negative 1 divided by 2a. So you'll have negative 3 plus or minus the square root of, this is 9 minus, uh, 9 plus 8, right? So the 9 plus 8 is 17 divided by 2 times 2 is 4. So you end up with x is equal to negative 3 fourths plus or minus the square root of 17 uh, over 4, right? So, you, I mean, it's not a pretty looking answer here. Um, and you can, I mean, you can like, you can't, you can't necessarily get a better looking answer than that. It's, it's just in general, it's not like a wonderful, uh, it's not a clean answer. So, um, that's that usually is what comes out of the quadratic formula is something gross. Okay, now there's there's some benefits to the quadratic formula, or at least just looking at it. And the main thing that determines what can come out of it is the discriminant. So this discriminant is what we call this b squared minus 4ac term, which is what's underneath the square root. Now, if if that b squared minus 4ac that difference is zero, it means we were dealing with a perfect square trinomial and that there's only one answer that will come out of the quadratic formula because you have negative b plus or minus zero, so it doesn't change, so divided by 2a. So negative b over 2a would be your answer, uh, and that would represent a, a situation where the vertex of a, of a, of a, 
of a uh, parabola is right on the x-axis. You have two answers that are the same, essentially. Okay. Uh, if you have a positive, right? If your if your discriminant is positive, you're going to have two real roots that come out, just like we had in the previous example. Okay. And then if you have this underneath the square root is negative, then you're going to have complex roots because you're going to be taking a square root of a negative number. You're going to have i involved. And those are what are known as complex roots. Or a complex, a complex root is a is what we kind of call an answer to a quadratic that has an, a non-zero imaginary part. So we have i. So what would the roots of this quadratic be like? We can just look at this b squared minus 4ac, and it doesn't have to be super involved. It's going to be 4 minus a big number because 20 is big, right? 4 times 20 times 1 is 80. So 4 minus 80 is negative 76. We're going to have a negative number in there, so we're going to have two complex roots, okay? They, and we don't have to solve them, but that's what that's that's why this is useful. All right, here's another example. If we wanted to find what this would be, we'll say 20. So, so 25 uh, and 9 and 30. Okay, so b squared. We're looking for b squared minus 4c. This is 900. 9 times 25 is 225 times 4 is 225 times 4. Wait, that's 900. 900 minus 900 would give me zero. So this is going to be, uh, there's only going to be one root. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a one root with a multiplicity of two. Now, we should have seen a red flag right away already for this one, actually, because this is a perfect square trinomial. It, it meets the, the things that we need to check. Is this leading coefficient perfect square? Is the constant a perfect square? Yes. Check to see if this middle term is two times the square root of this times the square root of this. If it is, which it is in this case, uh, we're good. So. Uh, we need to, you know, you should be conscious of that first because this would have been easier just to straight up write it as 5 minus 3 and, so 5n minus 3, 5n minus 3, yeah, quantity squared is equal to 0. So the answer to this is just uh, 3 fifths, right? We don't even have to really think about it that much. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind. Okay, let's get into some problem solving now. I know this is already kind of a long video, but we'll have just a couple more and it will be done. Find two consecutive positive even integers whose product is 528. Okay, so let's let n equal uh, positive, positive even integer, integer number one. And then n plus two is our second one, right? That's our second one. We know that because if our first one was two, the next one would be four. And we, go, we had to add two every time to get to our next uh, our next even integer, right? So n and n plus two, those are our two integers. And if I multiply those together, it says that the product is 528, okay? So n squared plus two n, two n is equal to 528, right? Now this is a quadratic, n squared plus two n equals 528. I'm gonna opt to do this by completing the square. So I'm gonna have to add one to both sides. So n squared, plus 2n plus 1 is equal to 529. So n plus 1 quantity squared is equal to 529. Uh, and if I square root both sides, it's n plus 1 is equal to the square root of 529. Sorry. So sorry, pen wasn't working. Square root of 529. So this isn't one of the ones that's obvious if you don't know your your perfect squares 529 is a perfect square it's 23 so n plus 1 is equal to plus or minus 23 so we could have then that n would equal uh positive 23 plus 1 would be 24 or n would equal uh positive wait sorry that would be negative 23 minus 1 that'd be negative 24 positive would be 22 and what we know where they're positive so it can't be negative 24 so my n is 22 so 22 is my first one, 24 is my second one, okay? Okay, here's another one. Uh, one leg of a right triangle is four inches longer than the other leg. If the length of the hypotenuse is 20 inches, find the length of each leg. Let's just draw a picture for this one. Okay, so here's our triangle. One leg is X, the other one is longer than that by four inches, and the hypotenuse is 20. Okay, so here's our triangle, and we know how to we know how to do this, right? Because we have the Pythagorean theorem: a squared 
plus b squared is equal to c squared. So if I fill in a, a squared b squared is c squared here, I could say that the first leg is x squared plus x plus 4 quantity squared equals 20 squared. So x squared plus x squared, if I four, so x plus 4, sorry, what is x plus 4 quantity squared? It's x plus 4 times x plus 4. So you've, you can multiply this out. You'll have x squared plus 8x plus 16. So one thing to, to know here, right, is that x plus 4 quantity squared does super not equal x squared plus 16. If you do this, your teacher will hate you forever. So try to avoid doing that. Okay, uh, so x squared plus 8x plus 16 equals 400. That's what 20 squared is. So we'll have 2x squared plus 8x. And if we move the 400 over, like subtract it over, we'll have minus 384. I did that in my head. I'm very smart. Okay, I can take a 2 out of all of these terms. So that's what I should always try to do first when factoring is, fa is factor out the greatest common factors, which is 2. So 2 times x squared plus 4x minus see if I can do this in my head and be smart again, uh, be 192 equals zero. All right. Um, so then uh, we can, we can divide everything by two and we have x squared. We don't need a parentheses now. X squared plus four X minus 192 equals zero. I think 192 can factor, but it's 12 and 16, I believe, too. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be x uh, plus 16 times x minus 12 is equal to zero. Uh, is that right? 12 and 16? Yeah, I think so. Isn't it 12? So that's 48 plus 144. Four, four. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so uh, this would be x minus, so x could equal negative 16 or x could equal positive 12 uh, but it can't be negative 16 it would have a negative side length which doesn't make sense so my side length my small side length is 12 my other side length would actually be positive 16 here so 12 and 16 are my two legs this is actually it's a 12 16 20 right triangle which of course is a is a multiple of a 3 4 5 right triangle so um yeah this is that's those are the leg lengths all right, and one last problem. A piece of wire 60 inches long is cut into two pieces and then each piece is bent into the shape of a square. Okay, so this is kind of complicated. All right, so we have a, a wire that's cut in half. Okay, the length of this wire is X and the length of this wire would be 60 minus X. Because we had 60 total inches and we cut it into two pieces. All right, then the, the piece is bent into the shape of a square. So we take this thing, if we kind of fold it right here, right here, and right here, we can bend it into this square right here, okay? Which means that each length, each side of this square would be x divided by 4, or 1 fourth x, okay? It's an x divided by 4 by x divided by 4 square. This one, if we did the same thing, okay, we'd have a square like this, and we'd have 60 minus x over 4, and 60 minus x over 4. And so we know how to calculate the area of a square. It says the sum of these two areas is 117 square inches. Okay, so that means x minus 4 times x minus 4, which is x minus 4 squared, plus 60 minus, oops, 60, 60 minus x divided by 4 squared. That's got to equal 117. Okay, this looks gross. So let's just do what it says to do. So x, x divided by 4 quantity squared is x squared divided by 16. Okay, this one here is we have to multiply 60 minus x quantity squared out. So we have 3600 minus 120x plus x squared divided by 16 equals 117. All right, if I multiply everything by 16 here, that's going to make life easier for me. So uh, I don't have to do fractions. So if we multiply everything here by 16, we will get, uh, what do we get here? We get X, so we're going to have x squared plus, and then on, this is on the left side, x squared plus x squared minus 120x plus 3600. I just rearranged what's going to be on the top over there. And then that's going to equal 
1872. That's what 117 times 16 is. Okay, combine like terms, 2x squared minus 120x plus, uh, if we subtract 1872 from both sides, uh, we'll have, what's that, 70, eh, what is that, uh, 1728, is that like a Fetty Wap thing, 1728, I think it is, plus 1728 equals 0, okay, divide everything by 2, so x squared minus 60x plus 864 is equal to 0. Now this is going to factor, it factors to x minus 24 times x minus, so it would have to be a 6, right, so 26, or no, 30, 36, 36 equals 0. Okay, so uh, x plus 24, so sorry, x is equal to positive 24 or x is equal to 36. Um, so either way, if you choose 24 for your x value, 60 minus 24 gives you 36. Or if you choose 36 for your x value, 60 minus 36 is 24. So the two lengths happen to then be 36 inches and 24 inches or 24 and 36 either way. So that's how you solve that problem there. It's a little complicated with the big numbers. But in general, uh, all these problems are sort of set up similar. You're going to think about what it's saying and then you're going to come up with a quadratic and just solve for it whatever way you want. All right, that's the end of this video for 1.3. 1.4 is just going to be more application problems.